Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is Asset Management in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management, Maintain Assets. My name is Tim and I will be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams Live Events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you are agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within the coming weeks. If you have questions for our presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout the session and in a live Q&A segment after the presentation. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Nicole Kemp, Senior Fast Track Solution Architect, Ann Krupke, Senior Fast Track Solution Architect, and Johan Hoffman, Senior Product Manager. Ann, over to you to get us started. Thanks, Tim. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from today. Thanks for joining us to talk about the asset maintenance in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Ann Krupke. I am a Senior Fast Track Solution Architect here at Microsoft. I work on the SCM team, and you can see my contact information here as well as my LinkedIn. If you want to connect or have any questions after the fact, please feel free to reach out. I'm going to toss it over to Nicole real quick to introduce herself as well. Yep. Hello, everyone. Nicole Gump. Uh, you can connect with me as well. You can see my uh, email and LinkedIn information. Thanks, Nicole. This is the fifth and final Tech Talk in our Tech Talk series on asset management. The previous four recordings are all available on the Dynamics Community website, and you can easily access though at those at aka.ms slash asset management tech talks. If you want us to do any more sessions on the general topic of asset management, please do let us know in the survey that Tim's going to share uh, that asks for the general session feedback. We want to hear from you in terms of what you would like to see from us. We've brought back the riddle of the day to keep things interesting. Today, the riddle is what is the most famous bank where children store their assets? Feel free to let us know your guesses in the chat and we will let you know the answer at the end of the session. So let's talk about our agenda for today's session, which focuses on asset maintenance. We'll start by reacquiring our reacquainting ourselves with the acquire to dispose process and the concepts of maintenance that we'll be talking about today. Then we will configure and demonstrate the request of corrective maintenance. Then we'll talk about preventive maintenance scenarios and how we can configure those and execute them. Nicole will review the maintenance schedule. I will show us how to set up and execute work orders, and then we'll go through a few recommendations and resources and have some time at the end for Q&A. So let's, let's refresh our background of where we're at with asset management. This is the acquire to dispose life cycle that we introduced in our overview session. We have inquire, acquire, install, maintain, and dispose of assets. We covered acquire and install in a deep dive session last month. And this month we are covering the maintain steps of the maintenance process. As we also discussed in the overview session, there are many scenarios that you can use asset management functionality to support in your business, ranging from production and warehouse equipment to your shipping fleets, maintaining your facility, maintaining customer assets, or even tracking leased assets and the maintenance of those. In this tech talk, we are once again going to focus on the production equipment and warehouse equipment scenarios. And if you are interested in seeing deep dive scenarios on any of these other ones, please again, let us know in the feedback survey that Tim will be sharing. So now let's recap the, matri the maintenance concepts that we introduced in the overview tech talk. First, we have maintenance requests. 
These are requests that are made to a manager or planner that indicate an asset needs maintenance or repair. This can be raised by anyone who notices a machine needs maintenance. Then we have maintenance rounds, which are maintenance tasks that you need to carry out at repeating intervals or on many assets or uh, types of assets at the same time. And the third way that we can track maintenance is via maintenance plans, which defines rules for pre-planned maintenance jobs that can be based on counter values or the passing of time. When we classify these kinds of maintenance, we typically look at maintenance requests as corrective or reactive maintenance, and maintenance rounds and maintenance plans are preventive and predictive maintenance. These three components together make up our maintenance schedule, which is the complete list of all maintenance activities that we need to execute within a certain time frame. And from our maintenance schedule, we convert to work orders, which are then assigned to maintenance workers and used to record the execution of maintenance activities, which includes the materials consumed and the time spent on maintenance. Of course, you can also manually create one-off work orders as needed instead of following the process that we just laid out, but this is the main process that we will be highlighting today. Now let's translate those maintenance concepts to a bit higher level of a maintenance process. Our process will initiate either with a corrective maintenance, maintenance request or preventive maintenance plan or round and that will then trigger the maintenance process. From there, we will schedule our maintenance. So it's not only looking at all the different maintenance activities that we need to do within a certain period of time, but also who is going to do it and specifically when. We may also need to do spare parts procurement as part of the maintenance process if we don't have the needed tools on hand, although we're not going to go very deep into that in today's conversation. Once we've scheduled everything that we need to perform maintenance, we'll use work orders to track the current status of our maintenance activities and record time, expenses, and items used. All that data that we collect throughout the process of maintaining our assets then feeds back into reporting on asset performance as well as the cost of maintenance. As we covered in the overview tech talk, there is the project management and accounting module that is running as the backbone of tracking the cost of maintenance. We're not going to get very deep into the the projects set up today, but that is something we can go into in a separate tech talk if there's interest. And in today's session, we're going to be revisiting the Purple Pillow Company example that we introduced in the acquire and install assets session. If you haven't watch that. I definitely recommend you go back and watch that recording to understand how we set up the assets for our Purple Pillow Company and the functional locations. But to refresh our memory, if you did see it, we have three sites, a pillow manufacturing site, which has sewing machines, automated cutting machines, and forklifts. We have a distribution site, which also has forklifts, and we have a foam manufacturing site, which has foam lines and those foam lines have dispensers, curing lines and mixers inside them. The three maintenance scenarios that are we are going to walk through today are shown here on the slide. We have one corrective maintenance scenario where a sewing machine has broken a needle and two preventive scenarios, one where we do a weekly inspection of our foam manufacturing lines and one where we need to service a forklift based on the mileage. Before we get into the specific corrective and preventive setups that we need to do, we are going to cover some base setups for maintenance jobs, which are going to be related to the work orders that we execute in each of our scenarios. So essentially for each work order that we have, there may be one or more maintenance jobs that we need to execute as part of that work order. And these are the setups that we need to do to support that activity. The first thing we have are maintenance job type categories. These are the high level groups of the type types of maintenance jobs, which is mostly for keeping everything organized. Then we have our maintenance job types. These are the different options for the kind of maintenance jobs you might do. 
Maintenance job types can also have variants which add more details about the different ways a job type might occur. For example, if we have a maintenance job of type inspection, we could have variants for annual inspection, quarterly inspection, monthly, weekly, etc. You can also set up the different trades that relate to maintenance job types, which could be the skills or work that would be done for that maintenance job type. For example, an electrical inspection may have an electrical trade associated with that job that helps us track the skills and certificates needed to execute that type of maintenance job, although that's not something that the Purple Pillow Company has requested at this point. And finally, once we have that set up, we can define our maintenance job type defaults, which let us pre-populate information about maintenance jobs in different situations. Now I know that was a lot of information, so we're going to hop over to the system now and review those different setups and how we configured them for the Purple Pillow Company. So to view the setups for maintenance jobs, we'll navigate to the asset management module. And under setup, we have a whole section called jobs, and you can see the different menu items here that we need to set up. We'll start with maintenance job type categories, which again are the high level groupings. In this case for the Purple Pillow Company, we have three job type categories, corrective, inspection, and preventive job types. This is all, all of this is is a grouping, so there's no additional parameters. Then we'll show you the maintenance job types that are contained within each of those categories, and you can see we, we started with four, although we may add some later. We have inspection, preventive, repair, and service. When I create a maintenance job type, I can see all the details at the top like we can in a lot of the asset management screens that just show me the number of other entities that we're relating this job type to. Under general, we specify which job type category, which we just created, is related to that maintenance job type and whether maintenance downtime activities can be related to this job type. We can also add a specific description that we want. We can specify the job type variants, which we'll come back to in just a second, that apply. If there are required skills and certificates, we can link those. We can also link succeeding maintenance jobs, although we haven't done that in this case. And then we specify the asset types that are applicable. Now let's go back to maintenance job type variants. And as I mentioned before, these are the different ways we can do a job type. So for we have annual, mileage, monthly, and weekly, and you can see for annual, we have the job types of annual service, annual inspection, and annual preventive. And we are able to see the relationship between variants and job types in this form, as well as in the job type form. We will not cover maintenance job trades because that's not something we configured for the Purple Pillow Company but we will show you now the maintenance job type defaults, which as I mentioned before, allow us to pre-populate information when we create work orders that meet this criteria. So this is, it's a query type format where we can specify the different fields, such as for a certain maintenance job type with a variant and an asset type, what the forecast should be and the, the default that information. So for a foam manufacturing line inspection, we have an hours forecast of two hours. So for any time we create a work order that matches this description, then we know how many hours we expect it to take. And that's linked to a forecast model. For our repair on the sewing machine, this forecast actually also includes an item. So in this case, we can have our hours, but we can also have items and we can use that forecast to drive procurement activities of spare parts that we need and have those spare parts automatically assigned when we create new work orders. So that is the different setups that we need just in the background to be able to then go forward and set up our specific preventive and corrective maintenance scenarios. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nicole, who's gonna talk about corrective maintenance. Thanks, Anne, for that overview and for setting us up for the next section. So we're going to cover corrective maintenance scenarios now. 
So for our corrective maintenance scenario for our purple pillow company, uh, we'll use the example of an employee working on the sewing machine asset who needs to log a maintenance request for a broken needle on the machine that requires a repair. So to set up our maintenance request, uh, we'll start with the maintenance request lifecycle state configuration. This defines the stages that a request can go through. So for our example, with the Purple Pillow Company, we have created the states new, active, complete, and rejected. Of course, if you had a more complex lifecycle model, you might include additional states such as approval. In the screenshot on the right, uh, we can see the configuration for the maintenance request lifecycle states. For the new lifecycle state, uh, we have enabled the active parameter. This indicates that the maintenance request should be active when it's in this state. We have disabled the set actual end parameter, which is used uh, when an actual end date and time uh, should automatically be entered on a maintenance request that is in this state. You can also configure uh, whether to allow work orders to be created from a maintenance request that is in this state, as well as whether the maintenance request can be deleted from this state. So for our new lifecycle state, uh, we want to allow both the creation of work orders and the deletion of a maintenance request uh, from this state. So the next step is to set up the lifecycle model uh, for maintenance requests. The lifecycle model is created by grouping the different states that will be part of the end-to-end -end lifecycle flow. You can have multiple models. For example, as we mentioned in the previous slide, if you have some maintenance requests that might require approval, you could create a lifecycle model that includes that additional state. But for the Purple Pillow Company, all requests use the same simple model, so we have only configured one standard request model. In this example, we have our four uh, different states that will belong to the standard lifecycle model of a maintenance request. Uh, this means that the request with this model assigned can go through the four different states that we have created and discussed previously, which are the new, active, complete, and rejected. So our next step is to set up the maintenance request types, which are used to categorize maintenance requests. For the Purple Pillow Company, we have created the request types for breakdown, inspection, and safety. A maintenance request type defines the affiliation with the maintenance request lifecycle state group. So we need to select our previously created lifecycle model on the general tab. We can also select a work order type for when a maintenance request is converted to a work order. The work order will automatically get the work order type that's related to the maintenance request type. So in this example for the breakdown request type, we have selected a corrective work order type, and we will cover these further on the next slide. So like the maintenance request types, the work order types are used to categorize work orders, and they also define an affiliation with a work order lifecycle model, which defines the work order lifecycle states uh, that can be set on a work order. So in our example highlighted here for the corrective work order type, we have selected our standard work order lifecycle model, which contains all the work order lifecycle states. We have disabled the one maintenance worker parameter, which is used to indicate that all work order jobs that are related to a work order of this type should be scheduled to the same maintenance worker. We have selected the cost type of corrective from the available values of corrective, preventive, or investment. Note that all work order jobs on a work order must have the same cost type. And then we have disabled all parameters under the mandatory section. These values are used to specify which fault related or maintenance downtime related information is added to a work order of this type. So we will now demo um, how our employee who's working on the sewing machine would request corrective maintenance for their broken needle. So first we'll navigate to the production floor execution interface in the production control module. And I will log in with my badge ID and click sign in. Since I need to report a broken needle on the sewing machine, I'll switch to the maintenance tab. 
I can see previous maintenance requests on the left hand pane, but to enter a new request, I'll click request maintenance on the right. I can then enter a descriptive title and any relevant notes for the maintenance worker. Note that the asset ID is auto populated on the maintenance request because it's linked to the production resource that I'm logged into. So when I am done uh, typing my notes, I'm going to click OK. And then I receive a message that my maintenance request has been sent and it appears in the maintenance requested list. If we switch back to the application, we can verify that our request has been created in the asset management module under active maintenance request. If we open the maintenance request record that was just created, we can review the details, such as the notes that were added by the employee. We can also add a maintenance job type. In this example of corrective maintenance, we can select the repair job type for the broken sewing needle. We will close the record to save it. And that is the end of our demo for requesting of corrective maintenance. So I'll pass it back to Anne, who's going to cover the preventive maintenance scenarios now. Thanks, Nicole. These are the two preventive maintenance scenarios that we're going to configure for, which we mentioned in the overview. We're going to set up a weekly maintenance round to inspect the foam manufacturing lines at the beginning of the week and make sure everything looks OK. And then we will also set up a maintenance plan to service our forklifts every 50,000 miles. Just like for corrective maintenance, we also need to have preventive maintenance work order types set up to be used in preventive maintenance scenarios. I have this preventive maintenance one that we created, just a standard one. And the difference here is that the cost type is set to preventive. For the mileage based scenario, we need to have a counter set up on our forklifts that we'll use to trigger the maintenance job. We covered counters in some more detail in the acquire and install session, but I will so just show you the setup we did for this specific counter. This counter is tracking mileage. The unit is miles. The update is manual and it's applied to all assets that have a type of forklift. On the asset counter record of my forklift 101, I updated the counter value manually based on our readout, which is at now at 50,001 miles. And that's the threshold that it will have passed to trigger maintenance. Quick reminder that with the new sensor data intelligence add-in, you can also use IoT sensors to update counter values. But in this case, I did just do it manually. And now let's move over into the system and I will show you the two setups I did for those preventative maintenance scenarios. In the asset management module, we'll navigate to setup and preventive maintenance. We have two setups, prevent maintenance plans and maintenance rounds, and we'll start with maintenance plans. This is going to be for that forklift scenario. This is the maintenance plan I created. I set my plan date and activated it. There is some parameters around when the execution, how much tolerance there is around the execution. And then down under the lines, this is the, the triggers for when asset needs to be maintained. And we have two lines that I've added here, one that's based on the counter for mileage and one that's just based on a period of time for an annual service, whether or not we hit that counter. I can specify for each of these lines which maintenance job type should be created when that line condition is met and the variant of that job type. The interval type tells me how, um, how to consider the next time or the, the distance between the two every time the plan creates work orders. So you can see we have many options which are well documented in the Microsoft Docs site. For our counter, we're repeating on the aggregated value because we want it every 50,000 miles. And for the annual plan, we're just going to repeat from the plan date. So once a year based on when the plan started. Although, as I mentioned, there are many other options and you can find more details about that at the Microsoft Docs article. For my mileage counter, I've set my period frequency to 50,000 relating to the miles and assigned that counter that I showed the setup for and my period for the year is one year. 
You'll notice on the right as well that I can specify different service levels for each one. So I actually want to have a higher service level when it's based on the number of miles versus just an annual one is less critical for me um, and can be serviced with a bit more flexibility. There's some more information we can fill out here, but this is the setup that we've done, and I've made sure that my asset FL101 is assigned and my asset types can be assigned as well. We can also assign this to functional locations and functional location types. Now let's look at the maintenance round I created, which again is more of a periodic uh, maintenance plan, especially when you're doing it for all assets in one location or all assets of a certain type. I've created my weekly inspection round and I've got my start date populated. In this case, I've set up a functional location line for my foam manufacturing plant and all assets that are of type foam manufacturing line should be inspected weekly. I have a variant as well, so it'll be a job type of inspection with a variant of weekly. My period type is every week, every one week, and it will start. It started at the beginning of this year. So this will create a work order for each asset or a maintenance line for each asset that meets this criteria when I run my maintenance round. So the maintenance plan was for our forklift scenario and the maintenance round was for our inspection scenario. And that is the setup we did for preventive maintenance. Now that we've got preventive maintenance set up, we can go over and show you how to create the actual maintenance work once those conditions have been met. So back in the system under asset management, periodic, preventive maintenance, we have two jobs. We have scheduled maintenance plans and scheduled maintenance rounds. Schedule maintenance plans, we'll look at all the maintenance plans within the period that we set here. So for this, we're just looking out for the next month and determine whether we need to do maintenance. We can choose to automatically create the work order from the maintenance lines that get created, but in this case, I want to manually review. Same thing with schedule maintenance rounds. This will look at all the maintenance rounds within the defined period. So for this example, we can do it for the next month and we'll get the weekly inspections for the next month. We can also, again, auto create work orders. We can filter on specific maintenance rounds or run this in the background. So both of the jobs that I just showed can be run automatically in the background as well to provide efficiency. Now that that's completed, we'll have those maintenance plans and maintenance rounds added to the maintenance schedule, which I'm going to now hand it over to Nicole to talk about. Thanks, Anne. So let's go through um, our demo of converting our maintenance schedule to work orders. So if we jump back into the system, we're going to navigate to the open maintenance schedule lines, uh, which is in the asset management module under maintenance schedule. We can select a single schedule line for repair. This is for our sewing needle and we select new work order. We're going to switch the parameter to one work order per, and then we're going to select maintenance job type. We're going to switch the work order type to corrective uh, for our repair maintenance request. When I click OK, we can then review that the work order has been created by clicking the alert at the top. In the message details, I can see the work order number. But we can also select multiple schedule lines from this view and create a new work order as well. So I'm going to select all of the inspection job types and click new work order. And then we can again switch the parameter to one work order per, but this time select the asset and date parameters since the lines originated from a maintenance round. The work order type default value of preventive uh, is what we'll use. So when I click OK, I can again review that multiple work orders have been created this time, one for each combination of asset and date. Here you'll see I received a warning just because I didn't have a maintenance job type default set up for these assets. However, my work orders were still created. So that's the end of the demo for converting uh, the schedule 
to work orders. So I'll hand it back to Anne to cover the work order execution now. Thanks, Nicole. Here we need to be um, also defining our work order life cycle states, the different statuses that the work order can have as we go through the work order cycle, just like we did for maintenance requests, just like we did for assets for functional locations. We have a completely separate setup for work order life cycle states. The states that we've chosen for the Purple Pillow Company are new, scheduled, released, waiting, which would be used optionally if for some reason the work order has been scheduled but can't be executed, and we want to be able to report on that. Executing, which means work is happening, work complete, and then closed, which for us represents financially closing the work order. And I'm going to go into the system to show you the setup for this because there are quite a few parameters that we can control. In asset management, under setup work orders, we're going to select life cycle states. And on the left, you can see all the different states that we created based on our requirements. And I'll look at the new work order state just to show you the details there. We can see how many life cycle models it's assigned to. And then under the general tab, we have a lot of parameters that we can add. For the work order, we can determine whether a work order in that state is considered active, whether we can add or delete lines from a work order in that state, whether we can delete the work order in that state, and whether that work order state allows the work order to be scheduled. In this second column, we have set actual start and set actual end, which determine if the work order is set to this state, then ask to set the, the actual start or end date and time of the work order. We can also determine whether setting the work order to this state should post any open journals on that work order, should process the maintenance checklist, or reset the related asset counter. For the project backbone behind the work order lifecycle um, or all of the work orders, you can determine what stage of the product project this relates to when the work order is in this stage, because again, we'll get a sub project created for each work order and whether sending it to this stage to close the activities. We can also determine whether we want to copy the forecasts during this state, and that's again going back to those maintenance job type defaults. We've got our schedule ready start end, and delete schedule lines, whether we allow that or whether we want that update to happen. We can relate it to maintenance request lifecycle states. So when the work order state is new, the maintenance lifecycle state is active, whether this state should then push an update to the asset bomb or whether we want to reference work order pools, which is not something we're using for Purple Pillow Company. Also, for every state that we have, we can set up different parameters for validating whether or not um, the additional functionality is, is being used that we want to, but in this case, we're not validating any um, of th that information. So those are the work order life cycle states. And just like every other time we've set up life cycle states in asset management, we need to add those life cycle states to a life cycle model. So here you can see we had added all of our work order life cycle states to our life cycle model. We just have one standard one. If we had different kinds of work orders that go through different states, fewer or more states, then we could create a separate life cycle model to reflect that. We also need to add maintenance workers and maintenance worker groups if we're going to use scheduling and assign workers to work orders. First, you'll create the maintenance worker group, which I've pictured on the left. I just created one that is a general maintenance group, but if you want to split up your workers differently, you can create additional maintenance worker groups. On the right, I have shown a setup of adding a maintenance worker. This is not the same thing as a worker um, in the human resources module. This is an additional specific step for maintenance. So this is asset management setup workers workers. I've added myself as a worker and specified the human resources personnel number that I relate to. 
And then I've also created myself as a production resource, which then allows me to put myself against a calendar for capacity scheduling of the of the worker when we schedule maintenance. And that is what you see under the general tab for resources. I've added myself to the maintenance worker group of general, and then we can specify which functional locations that maintenance worker works at. For me, I gave myself everything because I can teleport, but in general, you'll probably have at least a site related maintenance worker um, unless you really are traveling between sites. Now that we've got that setup done, let's complete the execution of one of the work orders that Nicole generated through our maintenance schedule. So back in the system, we're going to go to work asset management work orders and select all work orders. We do have different views which allow us to look at subsets of work orders, but I'm just going to go to the general one. We will select this work order number 13 to execute this corrective work order. I'm going to select it and open it so we can see the details. On the header, we can see the service level and the expected start and end times and dates. We can see the maintenance job, which is in this case, the job type is repair for our asset SM 101, which is the sewing machine Nicole requested maintenance on from the PFE. We can see in more details down at the bottom, including sub, the sub project that was created to track our maintenance costs. If we go up to the top tab under project and select forecast, we can review that maintenance hour forecast that was assigned based on the maintenance job type defaults that we set up and the spare item part number as well. The first thing I'll do now that we've looked at the details is under general, I want to schedule my work order to a specific resource. I'll click schedule and I'll just use finite capacity on my worker in this case. And you'll notice we went through that kind of fast, but that was something we could run in the background so we could schedule work orders in batch if we wanted to. I'll refresh my work order. We notice the status has been updated to scheduled and the scheduled start and end times have been populated as well. And it's been scheduled to me. So you can see who the worker is, it's been scheduled to. Um, and you notice that the scheduled start and end time are an hour apart based on that maintenance forecast of one hour being needed for the repair. Now let's fast forward and assume we're ready to start the work order. On the work order tab under life cycle state, we will click update work order state and we'll be able to say this is going to be released. So this is for us a reporting thing. We can view just all the released work orders at once, and that means somebody can get started on it. Once I, the maintenance worker version of myself, have uh, gotten started on this work order, I can go back to update work order state and update the status to executing, which means work is in progress on the work order. Based on our setup for this, life cycle state, it's going to ask us to put the actual date and time that we started the work order at. And I'll leave it as it is and click OK. I can also fill out more information on this work order as I'm working. I can load screenshots on the description. There's a specific area for maintenance worker maintenance worker remarks, so I can put details in here as well. Um, and just say that I did need to replace the sewing needle. I could put any other remarks that I want and of course and as I mentioned attach documents as well or screenshots or pictures. To record consumption I can go to journals and you see I can do hours items and expense journals. I'm going to use the copy from forecast function to copy the expected consumption on this particular work order so it's taking that one hour of time and the spare part for my sewing needle that was expected to be used. I can also uh, specify a resource on the hours journal if I want. So this is uh, our time consumption and our spare parts consumption. When everything looks good to me, I can manually post the journals. You'll remember from our lifecycle states that we can also automate journal posting 
on the on the work orders and we can automate the copy of the forecast. So in this case, the journals have then been posted for the consumption and will say that I have completed all the work I need to do on this work order. I can go back and update the lifecycle state to work complete and click OK. You'll notice the available check marks there. That's basically saying which states can we go from and to, and that's controlled on the work order lifecycle states. You can specify that, and I've just left it wide open for, for ease. Again, I have the parameter set up that says when you're going to work complete, you need to put an actual end date and time in, which I've done here and clicked OK. And then the last life cycle state that I have is going to be closed, which would be somebody coming back and um, financially closing. You know, this is this is financially reviewed and closed out. For the purple pillow company. That is a very kind of basic walkthrough of how we're using the uh, the work order execution, and there's a lot of additional functionality that we didn't show because we were keeping it simple at the beginning. We may um, we may also use maintenance downtime, asset faults, condition assessments, maintenance checklists, and more. But we did just keep it very simple to get started because we're not tracking maintenance at all today. We just want to have something in the system. So that is the demo of executing our work order. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole now to talk about resources and recommendations. Thanks, Anne, for that demo. Uh, so we want to wrap up today with some recommendations and just reminders of resources that are out there for you uh, to visit after this Tech Talk. So a few reminders. Uh, we are going to start with uh, start simple uh, with your setups and add your details later. So this just refers to um, your life cycle states and models uh, for both maintenance requests and work orders, as well as our maintenance job setups and scheduling. Um, for all of the things that we have covered, you'll notice that for our, our Purple Pillow Company, uh, we have kept it very simple. There's obviously a lot of complexity uh, that could be added, uh, but we always recommend that you start simple. Um, our second reminder is to make sure that you use those defaults to streamline the process. You'll see that Anne uh, used that forecast um, copy from a function for uh, the work order execution demo she just did. Uh, so those maintenance job type defaults, you know, pre-populate data um, and just to make our um, process much more streamlined. And then our final reminder is just kind of Make it your own, right? Um, in a lot of the processes uh, that we did and demoed for you today, um, you know, we mentioned that things could be put into a batch job. We could also configure, you know, work orders to be automatically um, created, but we went through everything manually for our Purple Pillow company. Um, and we did that intentionally just to demo uh, the functionality, but you can really make um, this maintaining assets process your own uh, to fit uh, your particular uh, business requirements. So we uh, will go to a few additional resources that we have. Um, we have, of course, our Microsoft Docs uh, links for asset management. And we also have a couple of Learn, Microsoft Learn Pass for configuring and working with asset management. There are, of course, our community resources. So there is a Yammer group. Um, and then we also have our ideas portal. So if they're, if you're working with asset management and you have an idea for a feature you'd like to see in the product, um, as always, log it in the portal. Uh, that way we can prioritize uh, the backlog. And then, of course, uh, a link to the asset management tech talk series uh, that we're doing uh, previous recordings, as well as this one will be available there on the community uh, dynamics site. And before we move to the next slide, Nicole, I mm -hmm. want to point out that one of the docs we linked specifically is the work order projects setup. So the project management and accounting module, as I mentioned before, is the, the backbone of everything we're doing as work orders. And we didn't dive into that setup because we wouldn't have enough time to go through everything we wanted to cover today. So we did link to that um, additional setup. It's it's pretty well documented, but if you did want an additional tech talk on, on that setup, do let us know. Yes, thanks for calling that out, Anne. 
And then as she mentioned, so not only that topic, but if there's any others um, that you would like to see covered as part of this asset management series, let us know. Um, as Anne said, we know we didn't have time in, um, in each of these deep dive sessions to cover everything. Um, so if you wanna see a deeper dive on scheduling, on reporting, on working with fixed assets with asset management um, or any other idea, uh, you can leave it in the chat or you can um, put it in the feedback survey at the end as well. All right, so most importantly, right, circling back to our riddle of the day, um, our riddle was, what is the most famous bank where children store their assets? You probably already guessed it. It's also in the picture and it's a piggy bank. All right, so um, we do have some time uh, for some Q&A here. So uh, Johan, I'll kick it over to you. Were there any questions um, in the Q&A during the presentation that we want to cover here? Sorry, should I go through um, the questions that, that has been um, asked by the audience? Yeah, yeah if there are any. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. I think uh, I'll do that. Um, so let me, um, let me look at the questions. They were in, in different areas. Um, first one uh, from Juris, the production line is facing problems and is stopped for the repair. The operator has to report breakdown of the line and request for maintenance. How could we take this scenario from production flow execution interface? So my recommendation, it would be to stop the production uh, activity uh, by, for example, logging into an indirect activity and then use the production flow execution interface to um, log a maintenance request to notify the maintenance department. Uh, as uh, Nicole showed you how to use uh, the asset management functionality on the production flow execution interface. Um, and it is so, so that a production job is scheduled on a resource and you can map a resource to an asset on the asset uh, master. And that is how you get the relation. Um, so again, a question, what is the purpose to report maintenance time from the production flow execution interface? So what we are doing is that we allow the worker to record what we call what we call asset downtime and also provide a reason code. Uh, the asset downtime recorded is used to um, calculate the efficiency of, of the asset and, and from the asset um, page, uh, there's a, a, a tab where you can calculate the KPIs, different KPIs based on uh, uh, registered asset downtime. Yes, again, a question around reporting um, downtime from production uh, from a resource. We, we do that um, by configuring the production for execution interface. We have a, we can add a tab called My Machine that allows you to register downtime, uh, maintenance request, and, and see the value of selected counters. Is work order planning and execution supported via the Power App solution? So we don't have a Power App solution yet. Um, we are actually building a Power App that should, uh, that is um, replacing the existing mobile app uh, built on a native Dynamics platform. Uh, this is slated for the spring release 2023. Uh, this experience will not have planning um, and dispatching capabilities in its first version. Uh, since the user, uh, since uh, since asset management uses project operations because every work order line actually linked to a specific project, uh, does it require licenses for production? Uh, no, it does not require additional uh, licenses. And I, I just want to clarify, yeah. Johan. So when we say that um, asset management runs on projects, we're talking about specifically the project management and accounting module that's native to Dynamics SCM and not the project operations service that yeah. has been released recently. Correct. Which is why it doesn't require additional licensing. Yeah. Um, then there's a question, in which module can I find uh, that setup? And that refers to the worker. Uh, it's a little bit confusing because um, the asset management worker 
is created based on an HCM worker. But the page is actually named worker. I think it should be named uh, asset management worker. You find it in the in the you find it actually under workers here in asset management. Um, so if you select that, you can see it's named workers, and that can be a little bit confusing when you search for it. Um, but it, this is where you define your asset management worker here. Yeah, and just to to point out um, all of the slides where we show the um, the configuration path, those are all those are all in the asset management module. So, yeah. for example, if you if you see this one, set up worker orders lifecycle models. Everywhere we put that path at the bottom of the screen, that is a all in the asset management module. Then there's a question around if asset management um, support, you know, key capabilities for linary asset management, like maintaining pipelines, transmission, cables, and so on. Um, and the answer here is no. Um, core capabilities for linary asset management are not covered by asset management. You might want to, to look for um, ISV solutions. Um, we know we have um, ISVs who are looking into that area. Okay. Uh, will there be a session covering the execution via mobile app? So, as I said before, the current mobile app that is built on, on a native platform within Dynamics called the Mobile Workspaces, uh, this platform has been deprecated um, and will not be available anymore, I think, uh, end of 2024. Uh, that's why we are building uh, uh, and replacing this app with a new mobile app for asset management built on the power platform and um, the, the, we, we are aiming to release this in spring 2023 and of course there will be a session uh, there will be a very nice um, TikTok uh, for this uh, new app for sure yeah we'll likely do that once it goes into public preview so that yeah. when it's available for everyone, you'll know how to how to use it. Yeah. And that was why we didn't demonstrate using the existing mobile app, because as Johan mentioned, it's going to be deprecated and removed. Then there's a nice question from Joris saying, could we have a TikTok about financial integration of the asset management module, please? And uh, Anne uh, replied yeah. Yeah, that that will be added to our list. Uh, why did you limit the license per 100 assets? So it's correct, there's a special um, licensing model uh, where you actually license per number of assets, per, per number of 100 assets uh, you purchase, up to 5,000 assets, and then it's for free after that. Um, um, so that is the special licensing model. Um, I don't have the straight answer why, why we uh, have this. Um, of course, there's, there's, there could be uh, scenarios where you had really uh, millions of assets, so um, that, that is why we probably have a special licensing model here. Relationship item plus serial number, functional location to be driven by warehouse on hand. The way I understand this question is, um, can we kind of drive material demand from uh, maintenance demand for spare parts. So when you have a work order, you might need some spare parts. Um, and of course, you would, would like to include that in your uh, planning. If you have a long lead time on spare parts, uh, you need to purchase them or produce them in due time. Um, and when you create a forecast like Anne showed, and you create the work order, uh, then um, this forecast can be included in your master planning, and then you can, can you know, see the demand, also take uh, on hand into account, uh, and drive the demand from that functional location, because on the functional location, you set the site and warehouse. Um, of, it needs a work order. We have customers asking for uh, also more longer term um, inclusion in, in the, and that is something we are looking at. Um, some customers are only creating work orders for maybe the next two weeks. 
uh, but spare parts may, might have lead times up to months. Uh, so when you schedule maintenance, then it might be nice to also forecast for, for those lines that lies maybe months ahead. Um, is it possible to combine plan and round schedule to be combined onto a single work order? Mm, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't think so. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure the, the result of, of you know, uh, the, the plan, maintenance plan and maintenance round that you set up is uh, what we call sh maintenance schedule lines. And um, you can set up the system uh, so you have a planner who will go through all these lines. You can multi select or group lines based on maybe asset uh, type or functional location. And then you can then you can uh, confirm these selected line into uh, work orders. And in this confirm dialogue, there's actually some grouping criteria. So you can see, and, and these maintenance line can stem from maintenance rounds or maintenance plans or maintenance requests, as Anne showed you. And so I think it should be possible to, to group them into to one work order when you do the grouping. You don't need to manually confirm the scheduled lines. You can also set up the system to automatically. Uh, 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 when you run the schedule, it, work orders are automatically generated and you can also set up grouping policies um, so that happens automatically. I, I do want to point out, though, um, as Nicole mentioned, the work order cost type there can only be one cost type. So if you if you had one work order maintenance line, maintenance schedule line that had one cost type and another mm -hmm. line that had another cost type, they couldn't mm -hmm. be on the same work order. But but everything okay. else you said is is correct. So there's a question from Matthew. Um, I move a serial number through a transfer order. The on hand changes inventory. Can the related asset be changed automatically from one functional location to the other? Um, not uh, to my knowledge, uh, you need to reinstall the asset to a different functional location. It is some. I heard about this requirement before that. Um, of course, an asset is not necessarily stationary. It's maybe something that move around. Um, so that's a that's a good input. But but Anne, do you have anything to say yeah, to so this question? You can it's a pretty fast process to move the functional location, but there's no there's no functionality to put an asset on a transfer order and move it and have that update the asset location. So you could if you wanted to use a transfer order, you'd have to have a separate stocked item that represents the asset. And then transfer that and then go back and update the asset itself, or you'd have to develop some sort of a customization. There's no support for that out of the box that I'm aware of. So this is a good example of something we might want to log on the ideas portal as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. OK, I think uh, Johan, thanks for reviewing the Q&A. There's no new questions and we're about at time. So I think we'll wrap up just by saying uh, thank you and we'll pass it back to Tim to wrap us up. Thank you. I am posting a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel now. You should see it at this time. We'd love to hear your feedback on today's session and hear what you'd like to see in future events. Thank you in advance for your participation. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be made available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within the coming weeks. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and to you, our audience, for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of the day ahead. <laughs>